Wonderful to be here. Thank you so much. It's, a, it's an honor to be in this house. It truly is. It's, I don't take this lightly, stepping into someone else's house. This, this is an important place. I keep up with you guys often. Uh, it's wonderful you guys post all your messages online so I can really see what's going on and uh, feel like I get to know, know you guys. I, my wife and I totally consider this our second home of a church. It's, um, as much as my job is, is to go out and really evaluate churches. Um, what, what I've been commissioned with, my wife and I, is to lead a house of prayer. And in so doing, uh, what we do is we, we go out, we, we look at other churches, we speak with other churches, that we have a vision that the Lord's placed upon us of churches holding hands in this region. This is, this is truly one church. This is, we have many houses around the neighborhood, but there's really one church. It's it's shocking, really, if you ever look to see how many churches are in Harrisonville. It's, it's pretty impressive um, for as small of a town as we are. Now, some people have hundreds in there at times. Some people have five in there at times. And, and we're in weird times right now. You, I, I swear the same church you can go in, and one day there's 300, and the next day there's five. You just, it's just weird times. So. But um, I say all that because f- from my standpoint, evaluating churches we keep coming back to here. I have a home church in Pleasant Hill, and that's where the Lord's plugged us in and where we intend to be for the duration. But this is the house. When people come to me and, 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 and ask me, what's a church? What's a good church to go to? This is what we consider our second home. And it's, there, there's a few things that contribute to that. It's, it's really, in my opinion, prayer and presence are, are the main commodities that have to be put on the forefront of the church. And it's interesting when I go to churches or when I listen to uh, many church messages and evaluate pastors' programs and things that they're doing, the church has changed. It's, it's just really changed, not just in our region, but <clears throat> programs have become the thing to do in churches. Programs have literally replaced prayer in churches. It is rare to go to a church where there's ever a time that they ask, come forward if you'd like prayer. It, it, it's really been dwindled down so much to a pastor that gives a prayer from the pulpit, and almost it. It's just really almost it. And it's sad, because it's, it's of utmost importance. So, in my opinion, programs have replaced prayer. Politically correct messages have now replaced biblical preaching. And popularity and platforms have gone by the wayside to take over the presence of the Lord. We're in a sad state now when we have pastors that outrun mega churches and have a great following and they preach words on milk all day long and everything's about self-help and things of this nature so i say this this isn't something i would say at most churches but it's something i say here because i know this church just like every other church since since really since covid's hit it's an unknown of what the church is going to look like this week to the next week to the next week but I think it's okay, and I think the church leadership is always evaluating what are we doing, what are we doing right, what are we doing that's effective, and, and I think it's time that the congregation starts being the one that starts thinking that way. We have to look and say, what is my church doing? Is it effective? Am I part of my church? Am I being effective? Because leadership only has so much bandwidth they can do. The church is only as strong as the members sitting out here. There's always going to be five or ten people that are really leading the charge, but it, it, it requires all of you to make a church strong. And so I challenge you guys to look at yourself, evaluate yourself, and it can't be by looking at how many people are in the seats. It can't be. Sometimes the greatest sign of a great church is that it's dwindling down, honestly. We're in a season where, where the chaff is being spread out. We're, we're, we're finding where the rubber meets the road. We're finding where real Christians are real Christians. It, it reminds me of Congress right now. Congress says that 92% of Congress are professing Christians. So to be a professing Christian certainly doesn't mean to act Christian-like. We wouldn't be having this conversation about Roe versus Wade if Congress was all Christian. It just wouldn't happen. So Christianity, is, it's, a, it's a fine line. If we're going to be Christians, then we need to be Christians. We need to be able to stand up for our Christianity. We need to be able to be a full armor of God men and women and people, which includes our children. You know, at, at my church, we don't, we don't deviate the message. If, we're, if my pastor's upstairs preaching a message on Hebrews 8, I'm downstairs preaching on Hebrews 8. 
There's times where the kids service that my, my lane is the five-year-olds to so kindergarten through fifth grade, so pretty young. We don't deviate the message. The, the, the life, life doesn't change when they grow older. Sure, you can soften the message, you can change a little bit, but they, know, they need to know biblical truths. And we're in a generation now, we're in a time, we're in a season where even the lead pastors are dumbing it down to make it palatable for adults, which is ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. So I say all this because this is a house that does not do that. This is the only house that I know of. I'm not saying it's the only one. This is the only house I know of that has prayer and healing meetings, especially focused on healing. It's unique. It's unique. It means you're chasing after the things of God. We can chase after things of man. We can chase after a platform. We can chase after a place where people want to come. We can have programs. We can have, we can have uh, let me say it like this. There's, there's, let's see, Jerry. How long have you been here, Jerry? You forgot? <laughs> Are you a founding member of this church? Wow. When did this church start? Wow. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. 67. Okay. So a guy like this that's still sitting in these seats has seen this up and down a million times. I mean, it's just, you've seen several pastors over the years. It's unbelievable. To step back and evaluate a church that has roots like that, it, it just blows me away. It's, it's important, why, and it's why members of this congregation should look to a man like you that's, that's been here, the elders. It's important. It's, uh, you serve as, as someone for us to look up to. You're a mentor to the younger generation. It's, it's just important. This house has root. Do the people change? Sure. But a guy like Jerry is going to be in here and say, man, there's times where people I really care about, I really love them, they're over at church such and such now. And why is that? It's hard to understand. It's, it's you know, you, you run this thing together, you grow together, you assume you're going to be together, and, and things change. And we can't always explain it. But that's what I'm saying to the congregation. Don't look around you to determine whether your church is doing well or not. You are here to serve a to serve one, just one. And it is simple. You just have to be effective to one. To figure out if you're on track just means to look at biblical truth. That's it. I mean, we can go down the street and say, hey, you know, Joe and Jimmy and, and Julie and Ann, they all went down to that church and they love it. They say that it's great. And did you hear they've, they've got a two-story rock wall in the basement for the kids. Everybody loves it. Maybe we should get a rock wall. You know, it's just easy to fall for it. And it's, it's just not important. It's not important. Are we teaching our kids biblical truth? Are we teaching our kids how to pray? And the church only has so much ability to do that. The church can pass it on. They bring you in, but your job is to come in, receive, and to go out, which means going out to your home and talking to your children. Parents, talk to your children. I mean, I... I make I weird out five year olds. They they're, they're gotten to the point they think it's normal, but five year olds are supposed to lay their hands on their on their friends next to them. They're supposed to, and they can't do it if mom and dad don't do it. It, it can't be uncomfortable in the home. It's got to be that way. My wife, my wife's the leader. She should she should be up here speaking. When it comes to prayer and worship, that's that's her lane. That's her education. She's night and day. I'm I'm a junior in her, and my son Eli will tell you. I mean. He'll come to Eli and be, get over here, pray for your sister. I don't want to pray for my sister. Get over, pray for your sister. Well, you're not going upstairs till you do. I mean, you know, it's, it's how it is, isn't it, son? I mean, it's just biblical. We can't expect the church to teach it. We have to walk it out. The church is a tool. This is a great church that gives these tools. But now we have to take these home and we have to talk about it. Um, here's why I think this church is so effective. I've spent probably... Two or three weeks in the Nash home doing a, a renovation a few years ago. And I'm telling you what, I've heard Pam, sorry I was eavesdropping, I've heard Pam talking to her children that, that are probably my age, maybe a little bit younger, talking to them about God, talking to them, speaking truth into them, but having her boys call up, I don't know which one she's talking to, but a boy on the phone calling and mom giving her, this is what God said. That's, that's their answer over and over again. It just blew me away. That, you know, First of all, you've got grown men that are coming to a mother that are in their 40s, and their mother doesn't say, here's what I think. It says, here's what God thinks. Here's how we're going to lead. And that's what it's going to take. That is what it's going to take. That's how Roe versus Wade is going to be overturned. It's, we have to have children that raise up 
and do this, and they can only do it by following us. That's it. We have to be man enough to do so. I have to remind myself daily how to be man enough. My wife lets me know how to be man enough all the time. It's, uh, it, it, it takes it. Women, you guys are very powerful, and you're very effectual for us. All right, I haven't prayed yet. I've been rambling, and forgive me if my message gets weird. I've been working on a message here for about a month, and at 1 a.m. last night, put that one away. That's not my style. I don't wait, like waiting until that long. So you've got a new one. It didn't get finally done until 7 a.m. I'm on a little bit of sleep. And so if I'm loopy, give me grace. I want to pray with you. Father God, Lord Jesus, thank you for this house, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. The most important thing to me, Lord, that nothing comes from my lips that doesn't come directly from your heart. Lord, I ask that your word comes forth, lands in the ears of the hearer. Lord, I ask that you plant your seed deep within the believer. This is a room full of believers that have your spirit within them. Lord, I ask that you water the seed that is planted today. That your word comes forth and it gives life, Lord. I'm asked to speak on prayer today, Lord, and I ask that you make it an effective message that it changes hearts. Lord, I ask if there's any fallowed ground within myself or with any of the people of the congregation here today that you go in now, that you uproot, that you turn the soil of our hearts, Lord, that we can receive your word, that your word is preeminent in everything and that the Holy Spirit waters this word and that over the next days, months, weeks, that this word springs up in us and that we become a people of prayer. That we become people that before our feet hit the ground, we are thinking of you and what your will is, Lord. For you know what is best. for Lord, I ask that this seed is planted and that it bears fruit. The crop is produced 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. That this house becomes a house of prayer. And that it changes families, Lord. There are families that need people in here to be effective for them. Extended families, children, parents. The power of prayer that can change everything through you, Lord. I ask that you place this within us, Lord. Love you very much. Amen. Amen. We say amen all the time. Who knows what amen means? Let it be. It's an important truth to learn. Let it be. I always say it's let it be so. It's important. It's not just, it is to seal the end of a message, but it has power. We use the word amen. Teach that to your children. Amen. Everything we just said, everything that just got, got said, that we've prayed over, amen. Let it be so. In the name of the Lord, let it be so. Thank you. So today's message is pray without ceasing. Change up the message. It may not be appropriate, still that same name, but it's, I didn't change the name. These are notes, basically, that are based on my walk with the Lord. Um, I don't pretend to be um, well-versed and a know-it-all in this. I'm, I feel like I'm here. There's giants in their prayer life that are up here. This is where I aspire to be. I'm right here in the middle, but I once was here. And so I'm growing in it. So what I'm hoping is that I can pass on some truths to you guys that have helped me in my walk and are helping me to have a a more effective prayer life, to have a powerful prayer life. My goal is just nothing more than if one thing can get out to you guys today that makes you more effective in your family, then we've got to win. It just takes baby steps, guys. So I'm going to give you what I got. I thought long and hard on how to give this message because My natural desire is to preach. I want to get up and preach. I want to be effective. I want to give a message. And people say, that was awesome. That's great. I'm empowered. But I don't know that prayer is the right message for me to try to give a a great preaching sermon on. It's it's able to. We can do it easy enough. But what I want is this. I had to decide, am I going to preach today or am I going to teach? And I've decided I'm going to teach. I think teaching is more important. So I hope I don't bore you. I hope that doesn't become a lecture but I want to teach today. Um, Number one, what is prayer? It's a great question, right? What is prayer? 
There's several types of prayer, but for today's sake, I just want to focus on, on prayer between one, us to the Lord. Not in a intercessory prayer, I'm just talking about how do we connect with the Father? How do we teach our children to connect with the Father? How do we first go here? Because in my opinion, this is the basis. Everything else grows out from here. The personal relationship with the Lord, being able to come to the Lord, speak to the Lord, uh, just like I'm looking at my son. Like I'm supposed to be able to go to the Lord any day and, and honestly say, he's there. I believe it. I want to replace this. The word faith is an important word. It's not, I'm not trying to flow it, throw it out. I'm not trying to say heresy, but I want in the church, I want the word faith to be replaced with fact. Because that is all it is. If you have faith in God, if you know what his word says, it's no longer faith. We don't have to see it. It's a fact, whether we see it or not. And it's a fact that my son is right here. And then when he needs me, he can come to me and we can talk and we can love on each other and we can share and, and exchange and we can have a conversation. And that's what prayer is with God. I think the biggest hurdle for people, for people is to understand that God is here. It's not mystical. It's not something that's uh, beyond reproach. It's something that you can walk right up to the Lord. You can close your eyes. You can feel him. You can feel his presence in you. The Lord is alive and active, and you have access to him right now, anytime. It is not something that we have to feel like it's a religious way. It's not a religious spirit. It's understand that God is nothing more than a man. Jesus has come to be a man. He is a man to commune with you. That's simple. I know, wait, is he an important man when he's Jesus? Yes, he is. But is he just like a father, a loving father that will pick you up? Yes, he is. And we have to understand this is the loving, kind father that we have, and we have to be able to go to him in prayer. We can't be afraid of it. We can't be afraid of it all. In my opinion, at salvation, at salvation, we receive the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is in us now, and we're we are changed. We're forever changed by that. And at that point, when you receive the Holy Spirit, He deposited faith in you at that moment. It says the measure of faith. You were given it. You've got it. So we have that faith. So we build upon it. We know it's there. It's now fact. And we consider it as fact. Who in here is a Levite? Who considers himself a Levite? One, there's my boy. A Levite is a worshiper. A Levite's a worshiper. That's their main job is to be a worshiper. I'd like you guys to leave sitting now and next time when I come and say, are you a Levite? Everybody's like, I'm a Levite. I'm on it. I just want you to know that we are a worshiper. That's it. That is truly it. God made us for his good pleasure. We are here to worship the Lord. We are here to worship him with our life. We're here to worship him with our service. Everything we do is, is worship. My, my bent is to preach. I, I want to speak. I I'm much more comfortable preaching to kids, but you guys got me today. I, I preach to kids. I love it, but honestly, it is secondary. I was just telling Rod this earlier. In my opinion, it is absolutely secondary, especially on Sundays. We come in to receive the Word because we, we want the Word, but the Word, we really need to be getting the Word Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And on Sundays, really, when we come through here, the way I describe it in any church, those are not doors. Those are gates. Those are the things that we open in his gates, and once we enter it, it's, we've entered his gates with thanksgiving, and that's it. It's on. It has nothing to do with us receiving a single thing once we come through that gate. Once we come through that gate, it's all about praise and worship. And It's not just when the music's turned on. It's praise and worship at all times. We praise and worship through prayer. We fellowship with him through prayer. So as a Levite, I know that doesn't mean it was a trick question, as Levites, we're worshipers. That's why we're created. But the priest, I'm going to read Ezekiel 44, 15. But the priests, the Levites, the son of Zadok, they kept the charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me. They shall come near me to minister to me, and they shall stand for me to offer unto me the fat and the blood, said the Lord God. You shall enter into my sanctuary and they shall come near my table to minister unto me, and they shall keep my charge. The part I want to focus on here is coming to the table. Our job is to come to the table. I, want, I think of prayer like this. It says it a few times in the Bible, 
that the Lord has placed a table for us. And the table's always there. It's literally always there. We have a Father at the other side of the table that is asking you every day, just, just come in and sup with me. Just spend time with me. I'm here. You're busy. Make time for me. I am here. I'm jealous for you. I want to be with you. I love you. This is what he's saying. I don't even know if I can say it in a way that makes it understandable how important he thinks that we are. I mean, you think about this. There's, my goodness, I mean, at one point, a third of the angels were cast out of heaven. Cast out. Did he go after them? No, he said, be gone. You're gone. But for you and for me, when one goes astray, he sends his own son and pleasures in the fact that his son is tortured and beaten and killed for us because he wouldn't let us go away. He wants us back. Can you imagine? I mean, it, it, we, we think about angels. We think about how, how just amazing they are, how beautiful they are, how glorious they are. And the Lord said, you're nothing. If you want to go, go. But, if, but he leaves the 99 to come get us. We have to understand our place. We have to understand our place. We have to understand ourselves, and we have to teach it to our children through prayer. We have to make them understand that we have to go after the Lord God because he's gone after us like this. This is, this is 80 years. Someone said this once, There's, that, that this is basically uh, an audition for eternity. I can't remember who said that. That's all it is. It's an audition for eternity. We've got this little amount of time to come to know the Lord Jesus here and to bring others with us. It's not all just our works. I believe our works are important. But prayer and presence is what it is. I mean, look at Mary. She was, in, she was talked about three times in the Bible. I think only three times. And there's not a single time she was ever found standing up. She was at his feet every time. There was a time she ran to him and then fell down. She's only at his feet. And, she, and, and she's talked of as one of the greatest in the, in the Bible. Merely just to be at his feet. We have to come in. We have to come in. Lord, I pray. I'm a man of prayer. I got to pray all the time. Lord, I just pray. Father God, please pull us into you, Lord. I know you give us free will. I know that it's our decision, Lord, but lure us in. Speak to us. Pull us to your table, Lord. We want to be at your table. Help us to see that your value is more important than all the things that go on in our life, Lord, that we would set apart dedicated time for you, Lord. Lord, thank you. Why should we pray? Great question. Anybody heard of Corey Russell? Corey's a, he's a, a teacher up in Kansas City at, at IHOP. He's part of Upper Room in Dallas now the last several years. Um, he's a great writer, unbelievable teacher. Um, I remember listening to him on a teaching. He's one of my wife's teachers still now. He has online school as well. Um, in Luke 11, he brought up Luke 11, verse 1. And I, I feel like after going through it, it's one of the most skipped over passages <clears throat> because Luke 11, 2 is the Lord's Prayer. So that's the go-to. That's, that's, that's the important one where, where people preach on. And, and of course, it's important. It's very important. I'll probably talk on it here as well. But Luke 1 is so simple, and it's overlooked over and over again. Luke 1 says, And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, teach us to pray. I often wonder which one of the disciples said that. I feel like it had to be. Lord, teach us to pray. Then instantly, I believe, I don't have it wrote down, but next I think it goes into when you pray, pray like this, and then it goes into the Lord's Prayer. And so we go straight to this verse, too, of, of how we teach. But you go back, and it's important. Lord, teach us to pray. I believe it's almost 
more astounding now to now that I think about it than than even the verses following. You think of it like this: three and a half years, the disciples worked, walked with the Lord for three and a half years. They they saw it all. They were at his side the whole time. Can you imagine witnessing all the miracles, seeing the feeding of the five thousand, watching watching God cast the demons out of a man that run into swine that run into the hill and jump into the water. You see lepers come up and, and instantly be healed. You see all these mass healings. You hear all this stuff. You see the, the greatest preachings ever seen, the wisdom and all this stuff. And throughout all this, the only thing the disciples asked, you never heard a phrase that says, teach me to preach. You never heard one that said, teach me to heal. Teach me how to cast out demons. Are these biblical things? Are they important? Yes. But it's astounding to me that these miraculous things that they watched day in and day out for them, they said, Lord, teach me to pray. That is so interesting to me. And I'm going to find what Corey said. He was quoted by saying, I'd be better off if I actually read through my notes, wouldn't I? All right, I'm going to paraphrase. I can't find it. So Corey said, they had found throughout their ministry that Jesus' public ministry was affected because of his private life and prayer. They had, they had whittled it down to that the reason he could do all this, the reason that he, that he was able to perform all this, he would go night and day and spend hours and hours in prayer. I mean, think about this. This is literally... God the Son praying to God the Father through God the Spirit. This is God. So God himself is praying to God the Father. So even in that, even though he's all-knowing, even though he's got it, he still finds it so uh, of utmost importance that he has to pray to his Father for power that literally the disciples saw him and said, that is what we need. If we can figure this out, the rest of this comes with us. That's in a nutshell what, what Corey is saying is that they found that to be the most important thing. And it's, to me, it's, it's amazing. I, I can't imagine that I would do that. I can't imagine that if I was there with the disciples, as that would have been the question I would have asked. I, I think I would have asked for something else. Wisdom, I don't know. I don't know. I wasn't there. I wasn't there. Okay, number three. How should we pray? I'm going to teach you what I teach the little children. It's an acronym. This is an acronym that has served me well. It's, it's just an acronym of P-R-A-Y, pray. Many of you have probably heard it before, but it's effective. It's, it's, it's effective for me. The P stands for praise. I believe, without a doubt, that in all circumstances, every time I come into prayer, I try to, to come with praise. I believe it's of utmost importance. It's, it's partially it's respect. It's putting things in its proper place. Um, it is biblical. I, I don't think that the Lord is harsh with you. I think there's times when we're hurting and we just go straight to the Lord and we say, Father, help me, and here's my problem. And, and I think that he's gracious to understand. that. When my child falls down and gets hurt, I pick him up. I don't say, hey, praise me first. But when my kid runs up to me every day and is like, I got one of them. We got a pile of them. But one of them, every time they call, I know, I know that this one, I won't name names, is going to say, hey, will you bring home food? Every time, it's going to be the first word out of my mouth. Not, hey, Dad, how are you doing this and that? It's, hey, bring food. Another one of my older kids, if my phone rings, it means he wants questions with his car. He needs help with his car. It, it isn't, hey, can you, you know, what's up? How are you doing this and that? It's just that. And it's, it's annoying, right? And I don't think our Father wants that. Our Father wants us to be like, Hey, Dad, how are you? You're awesome. You're great. This and that. Now I'm going to get to the question. I think that praise is of utmost importance. It keeps our minds in perspective that he is worthy. It's understanding that he isn't just the handout guy. He's there to say, you know what? I give to you because I love you and because you worship and honor me. I want to come and help you. But let's keep it in perspective. So I think that praise is of utmost importance. So I, I urge you, to come and praise all the time. So remember, he is the bridegroom, we are the bride. 
That's a hard one. That, that can be a hard one. It took me a long time being a guy thinking I'm halfway manly to wrap around that I'm the bride. It seems weird, but I've got it now. It's good. Actually, reminds me, I'm wearing this is this is a, 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 a company, the, the logo for a company of a guy that has taught me that. Uh, if you ever want to look into a guy, I highly recommend teachings from Eric Gilmore. Um, Eric Gilmore, this is Adoration, Sonship International. I reckon him to the most meek man I've ever met. And, and I, I believe that's a statement. I believe it's a real statement. And he has taught me some of that, how to be, how to be a man that can be softened down enough to understand that you're the bride and to fall in love with the bride. And so I say in prayer, it's awesome like that. With him being the bridegroom and us being the bride, we come to woo him. We come to give her affection to him. We come to love him and let him know that he is beautiful. He is glorious. He is amazing. He is it, things that a man would say to his wife, you can say it to your father, God. It's not weird. It might start out being weird, but it's not. It's just not. So the second one, R is repent. Repent can be a weird one. I don't want to mix up repent. I believe repentance is important. Repentance literally means, you know, hey, I was going this way, I was making some mistakes, and I turned from that. It, that's all repentance is, to turn away from the sinful thing, whether it's your mind, this and that, the things that you want to conquer. We've all got them, but we should be aggressively... Repentance has importance because you're coming to the Lord and telling Him, Look, I still struggle with this silly little area a little bit. Or, or that caught my eye the other day, and I don't want it, and I want your help. I need your help. So repentance is important. What I don't want confused about repentance is people thinking, hey, I got to go confess my sins every day, or I'm, I, you know, if I get caught, I'm, I'm not going to go to heaven. It, it's nothing like that. We're not going to try to put Jesus back on the tree again. We have to be careful with repentance and saying, no, you're, what you died for didn't cover me. He did. He, tie, he died for our past sins, our present sins, and our future sins. We are expected to exonerate our future sins. We are to work for that. Okay? Don't get me wrong. We are to work for that. But we need to repent for those little sins that we do. We need to ask forgiveness because it's honestly, it's just respectful. You know, if I, if I do something to hurt my wife, she's, she's taught me on this. I'm not great at saying I'm sorry. I'm not great at recognizing when I make a mistake. I'm overly prideful in areas like that. She's let me know about it. And it's the same thing with the Father. I owe him that respect. When I do dumb things that doesn't glorify him, you know, even if it's in my mind, I want to apologize to him. I, I, just, I just want him to, to know that I'm, I'm sorry. You're, that wasn't glorifying. So praise, P, R, repent. But keep repent in check. That's a tough one. It's a tough one to teach your kids. A is for ask. And ask is quite a bit down the line. You can understand why that is. I want to go back first a little bit. Praise. This is biblical. This is part of, of, of uh, uh, Luke uh, 11 too. You know, I say praise. I liken it to our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be his name. Okay? The Bible teaches that hallowed be his name. That is the praise. To repent. Forgive us our trespasses in which we forgive those who trespass against us. That was the repent. So to A, ask relates to give us this day our daily bread. We're supposed to ask. And we're not supposed to come ask about every dumb thing we could ever have. We're not going to ask for a million dollars. But the Lord knows what you want. He knows your desires. He knows it before you ask. But he wants you to ask. So it's okay to ask. We're supposed to ask. We're supposed to intercede. We're supposed to. We're supposed to be up here. I, after, after Rod's message this morning, we should all be on our knees asking for Roe versus Wade to be overturned. We just should. It shouldn't be an option shouldn't be an option and, and shame on us there's people that are put in that position that don't really understand that there's anything wrong because our society's taught that it's not really that wrong but if we can ask the lord to reverse this it give it 10 years from now and people will, will think it's just insane that that ever took place it, it'll just be gone it just has to be gone but we ask i challenge you guys to ask for roe versus wade I ask you to ask you to ask forgiveness for the, the women and the men that have that have put women in that position over time. I mean, there's, there's beautiful, wonderful women that are going to be going straight to heaven that have been in that situation. Our God's a glorious God. He's a forgiving God. But He wants this. So we come and we ask. The A is important. Give us this day our daily bread. And daily is pretty important. 
We should be coming to the Lord more than daily. I titled this message originally, Pray Without Ceasing, because that is a biblical phrase as well, because there is a life praying without ceasing. It really is. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be in full-time ministry. You have the opportunity to pray without ceasing. It can literally run in the background every day. It changes your thought process. It changes how you respond to people. There's sure there's times where it's dedicated and out there, but there's times where, I mean, I swing a hammer. That's, that's what I do for a living. It's not super glorifying, but there's a way to swing a hammer and to be praising and seeking the Father all day long. There's a way that you can build a house for somebody that says, hey, this might cost me money. That might have saved me some money. This might be lost, but this means something. This is glorifying the Lord. There's a way to, through your prayers, through your through your act of service, that you can be in prayer all day long. Finally, yield. Yield is the most difficult part of prayer, but yielding is a it's a skill that we have to master. We have to be able to say, Lord Jesus, I have asked you for these things, but your ways are higher than mine. Your word says that says that the foolishness of God is wiser than men. It says that the weakness of God is stronger than men. Our ways are weak. We don't know what you know when you have a plan. And sometimes your plans we don't like, and we would change it if we could. But I've asked, I've petitioned you, you know my heart, but I'm going to yield to you because you know best. Yielding is hard, and we have to get over it. I mean, there's, this is a hard message. I don't, I don't even like going down this road. There's people in this, ro- in this room that have lost people, or lo- you know, lost relationships, lost children, lost loved ones. That it wasn't fair, and yielding to that decision doesn't make any sense to us. And so it's difficult. It's really difficult. So I ask you that part that we talked about earlier, about letting faith be a fact, that we just let that rule our lives. When we don't understand it, it's okay to say we don't understand it, but you know what, God? I know you love me. I know that this is for my good. I know it's for somebody's good. I don't know what it is, but I know that you have a plan, and I have no doubt that your plan will work out for our good, and that we give it up. There's things we have to lay at the altar, guys. There's, there's probably, I don't know where I'm going here, but it's, there's people in here that hold resentment, that are in church all year, that come, <clears throat> come every week, that are hurt and broken, and feel like God has let them down about some things. It just happens. And it's sad, and I don't know why, and I don't know how to fix it, but I do know that without a, without a doubt that Jesus loves you, that the Father sent him to die for you, that these things are temporary, and that he wouldn't do it if it wasn't for your good. There's always something good that's going to come. And we have to trust God. We have to trust God, and we can't worry about it. We can't. I did a lesson months and months ago We've got two doors on our kids' stage because it's kind of a play as well. <clears throat> Trying to keep, teach kids, it'll try to teach you, is that you can't worry in one hand and trust God in the other. It, it's impossible. Our minds don't even work that way. You, know, you, you can't sit here worrying about something and trusting God at the same time. You can stop. You can, you can set down worry and you can pick up you know, trust. You can go back and forth, but you can't do it at the same time. It's not possible. And so I had these kids little knuckleheads down there touching a door that I wrote the word worry on and another door that I put the words trust on. It was fun as could be to watch them trying to stretch out and see if they could touch them both, you know. But I just just want you guys to feel that, that look, there's some stuff that you just have to at some point in time lay at the altar. You bring it to him in prayer, you petition him, but you got to decide, you know what? You made me, you formed me from the ground, you knew me before I was ever formed. You have a plan for me, and your plan is good, and it's going to be good. It's always going to be good, and I don't understand it, but I know that the God that made me loves me, and that because he knows me, that he's going to be trustworthy with my heart to take care of me. So I have to be trustworthy with his leadership, and I'm laying it at the altar, whatever your offenses are to the Lord, and come to him in prayer like that. And it's okay. he's, He's a big boy. He doesn't mind when you yell or you get upset or this and that he'd like you to come and repent afterward and say i didn't mean to talk that way but it's okay and i ask you guys especially men we've got to get out of the 
the norm. Like, my wife doesn't even know when I pray because she's a prayer warrior, does it everywhere, doesn't care when you're looking. I do it in hiding most of the time. <clears throat> and we got to get over that. Like, I challenge you, if you're a man that usually prays in the dark, somewhere in hidden, this and that, change it up, even if it's just for your relationship with the Lord. There's times where you need to shed tears. There's times where if you pray, sitting in a chair, then get on your knees sometimes. Just show the Lord that you mean it, that you mean business, that you're there to talk to Him, and that He's the most important. If you're always on your knees, then stand up, put your arms in the air. We have to get to a point where praying isn't weird, and we don't care who's looking. Actually, we want to get to where people are looking. Eventually, people will say, you know what? Maybe that's the norm. Maybe your kids will see it's the norm. I'm telling you, you guys are leaders. Every house is full of leaders. And if there's anything that we can teach is this prayer. It really is. Seek his presence. Find the secret place. The secret place can be anything. I've got tons of kids at our church that got closets and things like that now. They understand that, you know, I can tell my mom I'm going to the secret place. You know, you've frustrated me. I don't, I don't get it. I'm upset with you. You're probably right. I love you, but give me some time and I'm going to go into the secret place. Kids need to learn. Adults need to learn. The secret place is where you need to be. You need to find a place where you get away and you just talk one-on-one -on -one with God. And sometimes you don't talk. Actually, sometimes you need to figure out how to not talk. You pray a little bit and you sit and you wait. <clears throat> That's how I write these messages, really. I try to seek His presence first. I try to say, Lord, you'll notice I didn't introduce myself when I get up. The, the, the greatest thing that could happen is if you guys never know my name, never know who's on this pulpit, you don't care that you came up and you heard a word from the Lord and hopefully the Lord was able to speak. We're not important. You don't need to see another man. There's, there's nothing of importance that I have to say. If I say anything, if I say anything, there's, there's, there's a, a movement of New Age Christianity I think it was Spurgeon that said, if that with which is new is false. If you ever hear something new, it's false. I mean, the Bible was wrote a long time ago, and if there's anything that deviates from it, it's false. So we just have to find this secret place. We have to seek the Lord with all of our heart. We have to wait on him. A great read is, is there's a couple of books by Madame Guyon. Spell that one can't tell you, but you'd be able to find it. She, she is a master who was imprisoned, part of the Catholic faith, imprisoned for the fact that she believed in the power of the Holy Spirit, which was kind of a no-no. Spent a lot of her life in prison. She just mastered the ability of how to find a secret place and how to have communion just like that with the Holy Spirit. I recommend it. It's a, it's a great read to figure out how to, how to tap into that. But through prayer, you find the Spirit. And through, through that time of, of being in His presence, in His presence, just listening and seeking, when your mind is distracted, you'll find that. I, I feel like I'm the worst, that I can't concentrate for 10 seconds, and I'm off in left field. And it's okay, just go back. Just go back. If you need to have Scripture, then read a Scripture. And every time your mind waters, read that Scripture again. You'll be in His presence. Eventually, you'll be in His presence, and it becomes quickened and easier and you'll find yourself in the presence of the Lord easier, and then He speaks. You can pray to Him, and He will speak back. I just challenge you to do this, guys. This is some utmost importance. Utmost importance. How often should we pray? As I started off, the message was pray without ceasing. At bare minimum, it should be every day. Every day. It doesn't take much. I mean, prayer can be 10 seconds long. I hope for it to be much longer. But we have to pray every day. It's just like reading God's words. There's two things. I mean, you're, you're literally starving yourself to death, in my opinion, if you don't read His Word every day and get in His presence every day. Literally starving you to death. This is all that is important. Number four. Really, 
very sorry. I'm disorganized today. James 5.16 says, The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth me. This could be a... This could be a if if you want to pick one verse that you just say I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna put this to memory I'm gonna conquer having a lifestyle of prayer that's a pretty short prayer that's a pretty short passage James five sixteen but how much power does it have the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much it's effective. It's done in fervency. It means we're ongoing, we're repetitively, we're always in it. The prayer of a righteous man. It, it, takes, it takes a righteous man. I mean, it sounds like that's a hard word, but it's really not. Just righteous means nothing more than being right with God. To be a righteous man means I live by God's word. It doesn't mean I'm a perfect person, but it means that I strive to be in perfection through the Holy Spirit. I, if, if you take the word literally, it, it appears that we could be perfect that we could be sinless through his power. I know none of us have ever achieved it, but, but it means there's hope for us. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. If you could just put that to memory and think on it every day and walk into your husband's, walk into your house. I mean, you know, we, we know there's, there's battles that go on when you walk in the house, husbands. We know that sometimes it's, you know, she's going to tell me to fix that thing. She's told me the last three days. I know she's going to tell me when I get there today. We know we face some stuff that we don't want to, but if you can walk in the door every day and say, you know what, I'm a righteous man. Maybe I'm not perfect, but I'm going to walk in this door and I'm telling myself I'm a righteous man. I'm a righteous man. I'm going to teach my, I'm going to treat my wife in a way that says this is how a righteous man would treat you right now. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Say it in the car on the way home every day. Say it when you're getting ready to walk in these doors so that when you walk in these gates that you're already ready to praise and worship. I mean, it's just an important thing. I try to stay with our kids. I mean, it's tough. They all got a, a device. They all want to tune out as we drive to church. It's usually me and the kids drive to church. My wife goes ahead because she's got to practice before we get there. And, you know, the, the rule we try to do is that we shut it off. Whatever you looking at on your phone, this and that, you've got to get into worship. We need to start planning for the fact that when we get there, we're ready. We aren't showing up and be like, ooh, I'm in the seat, you know, only three minutes late. No, we're, I'm getting to this place, I'm going there, I've washed my face, I'm ready to go, I'm coming to meet with the Lord, I have an appointment, I have a date today at 10 a.m. with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's there. We have to do this. We can have this effective, fervent prayer because it needs to go on in your car. Moms, you're, the, you're literally the most important, most powerful thing. Our kids listen to you. Even when you say crazy stuff, they just, they are watching everything on you. Us dads are kind of powerless sometimes, I feel like. Like you moms, these kids, I got kids that are in their 20s that, just like Pam's kids, that they aren't calling dad, they're calling mom. So I'm telling you, get them in the car, pray like this. Say the same phrase over and over again. It sinks into their head and get them prepared that when they're coming, it's preparing you as well. Husbands, it's your role. You're supposed to be the leader. You're supposed to be the leader. Get the car ready. Help your wife to be on time. Get some stuff going. Have her water in her water bottle and her six bags and all the stuff. Lord knows what they need, but there's a lot of stuff. Get it ready. Help her out so that you can get to church on time and you can pray and talk in the car. And you know what? Sometimes that's even that we always talk about. Arguments arise on the way to church sometimes. That's your job to shut it down. Dad, even if it was holy mom's fault, you say, my bad. Let's start praying. Let's sing. Let's sing unto the Lord. Tell me, I just want to change your guys' lives, and I don't know how to do it except for the few little things. I don't know why the Lord has commissioned me and my wife to start a house of prayer. I have no idea. I, I, I have no idea. I'm his least qualified. I think, I think the verse that says that I'm... I'm not qualified to unbuckle the thong of his shoe was made for me. I don't mean that to be just people like to say stuff like, oh, for me. No, I just mean it like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't have any idea. But I know when the Lord asks you to do something, you do it. I'm trying to learn to pray. I'm not a speaker. I'm not a gifted speaker. That's why my notes look like they do right now. Changed it 1 a.m. Well, this isn't, my, this isn't my mainstream. I'm much more comfortable swinging a hammer. But when the Lord asks you, you have to step, and that's it. 
for, for me and my house, we've decided there's nothing we have. I believe the Lord gives you opportunities. I don't think he just hands you everything, but I think he gives you opportunities and gives you the tools and the skills and says, go and do it and glorify me with it. And if I've given you some stuff, be willing to hold on to it loosely. And when I ask you to give it up, to go do something else for me, give it up. And I promise I'll take care of you. If I, if I clothe the lilies of the field this beautifully, how much more will I, will I clothe you? If I feed the birds of the air, they don't store up things in, in barns and this and that, I will take care of you. And so it's, it's become easy for us. I feel like the world's changing. I don't know why I'm talking about this. I'm talking. I got the mic, so I guess you're stuck. Like, I, I'm going to point out with all of our kids, we've got six of them, and I'm literally, like, this one's smarter than I'll ever be. He wants to go be an engineer, and he, and he can do it, and I'm happy to do it. I'm happy to figure out how to get him through school, but I'm just, I just think there's more importance than night. And right now is the smallest one you ever have. When he goes to school and he, he has a great paying job, he's never going to go back and chase ministry work, probably. He's never going to have time to go to school, to ministry school. And I could care less what his future says about how much he makes. Honestly, I could care less. I want him to provide well for his family, but I've learned that the Lord is going to provide him and bless him and whatever he needs. So I'm trying to push every one of my kids now to go to school. I don't care how many jobs I got to work. If I can send him for a year to go to a ministry school, two years, whatever he wants, the same way with my daughters, this and that, we're just trying to push him because, man, these are the things that last forever. And you get stuck in the world when you got bills to pay and you've reached a certain level that you can't really do without. And I just feel no idea why I've gone here. Woo, who knows, but I'm just telling you, moms and dads, figure out that the important things to your kids, just keep them alive. I've got, I have six of them, and I'm telling you, some of them I thought, what is going to happen with this one? He's never going to move out of the basement. They're all taught the same way. We had one of our kids that when he had to clean his room, we just gave up. Like, I mean, he literally, he beat up the house, and I've patched a lot of holes for him. Why? Because I told him to do his laundry. I mean, just nuts. Nuts. Now he jumps out of airplanes and things. I mean, he's, he's great in the military. He's, he's great. Couldn't be prouder of him. But I'm telling you, I've got ones that, you know, that boy there, when, I'd, when he'd finally get in trouble, we'd just say, go chop wood. Cool, yeah. You want me to clean my room? I'm going to break everything. You want me to chop wood for three hours? No problem. I mean, it doesn't have to make sense, but that's just how it is. I've learned that we spend most of our time with kids trying to raise them up in a certain way that we that we hope is, is, is going to lead them on the right trajectory. But in the end, I figured out, as long as you keep them fit, fed and they don't die, they're going to listen to you. And in the end, it works itself out. It, it just really does. We stress over, i got so many younger people. What do I do with my kid? Keep them alive, man. Sit. Leave them in the car, crack the window, whatever. But I mean, you know, just, just keep them alive. The Lord is going to take care of them in the end. As long as as you surround them with prayer and identity. And I don't know what you're teaching this house downstairs, but I'm teaching on stuff that's unpopular because unpopular doesn't get taught. I figure I've only got these little kids for so long. I mean, I get kids that their parents get mad at me because I tell them, the Bible says you don't, you don't get divorced. You don't do it. Well, my mom and dad are divorced. Go tell them. They'll come talk to me about it. No, they're not going to be happy about the message. But the point is, it doesn't matter what we've done right or wrong. God is glorifying. God listens to us. God forgives us. But he expects us to quit doing the same stupid mistakes over and over again. And if we don't teach our kids right and wrong, then they're going to do it, you know? You got to talk to kids about their identity. I mean, it's, it's popular for boys to date boys and girls to date girls. It's, and it's, it's not going to change if parents don't Say something about it. It's just not going to change. I know it's hard. It's hard. And I, for one, am the one that says, I, I don't think that any of my sins are any less egregious than that sin. I don't think it is. But it still means that someone should be coming and talking to me about the stupid sins that I make, and we should be talking about the stupid sins they make, because iron sharpens iron, and the Bible says this. So let's let them lead a good life. Let, let, let's let me lead a good life, because you're willing to you know, have a mentor like Rod that would tell me if he sees me off track, let's do it. Let's, let's be men and women 
that actually take this thing as, as, for what it's worth and read the Bible for all that it's worth and we preach it for all that it's worth and we don't deviate from it, what it says and what it says. I mean, that's the greatest part about it. I don't, I don't have to be offended. If you're offended what God said, well, you can get mad at him, but I'm just, I'm just reading what it says. So it's real simple. We have to teach identity to our kids. I don't know why I've gotten on to kids, but it just feels like there's a lot of people in here that either have kids or they've got grandchildren. Someone has to speak identity into them now. Because it, it isn't getting any better. It's just time. Just time. All right, I'll try to wrap this up a little bit. There's a few, a few other pra- passages on prayer that I felt were important. First Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. I rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. I think there's major importance in giving thanks for everything. I've learned in my life that when I pray to the Lord, like I am that knucklehead that when I get hurt at work, I say thank you. It's better than words that could come out. Now, if you thank God for everything, he recognizes it. He really does. He recognizes when you say, you know what? I lost that job that I was, thought was going to be a good job for us, you know, being a small businessman, but you know what? I thank you. I'm certain that you had a better plan for it. I'm certain that you knew that that wasn't the right one for me. It wasn't going to be profitable. There's something, you know, you're going to bring something different. We can give thanks in everything. Ephesians 6, 18. Pray at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for the saints. There's a lot in that one, but I think it's important. I don't know if everyone in here has their prayer language. I don't even know where everybody lands on it. It's, it's first the church, it can be a controversial subject. I don't think it should be, but it's, it's a controversial subject. If you speak in tongues, I think one of the most important things in it is the passage that says, when you don't know what to pray, the, the, pray, <laughs> the Spirit will give utterance for you. And I think there's power in it. There's absolute power in the fact that you're like, God, I'm praying. I'm not smart enough to even know why I'm praying. I, I've been in this point where I, me and my wife have fought over this 400 times. I've asked it this way, that way. I've tried to stand on my head. I've done this. I don't know what to do. Clearly, I can't figure it out on my own. I'm going to pray in the Spirit, and maybe you can make sense of this thing. You know, it's actually, it's actually really peaceful to say, I'm honoring you. I don't know what to do. I'm crying out to you, and you know my heart. And what's beautiful, I think, is that the same spirit that that resides within me is the same spirit that resides within the person that you're having conflict with, whether it's in your marriage, your kid, or this and that. So I know you can do a work. So I'm going to pray in the spirit. I just, if if you haven't, if if it's not comfortable, just just start practicing. Just ask for the Lord. Ask for Him in prayer. Lord, I, I want my spirit language because it's powerful. My kids will tell you, in my house, you would think there was a foreign language going on. It's not me, it's my wife. Most of the time, she, she speaks in tongues more than she speaks in English. Just, she's just in tune with the Lord, you know? I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. And I, and I can say it from the standpoint that I'm the lesser in this area, but I've seen through her effectual, fervent prayer speaking in tongues that it moves mountains, and that truly you can say this mountain move from here to there, and it can happen. And I see it happen with her all the time. I see it happen all the time. So I, I've... I have no doubt. I was an ace there. I remember the first church I went to, I, I, I didn't get saved until I was probably about 30. And uh, this is weird. <laughs> I know about some of these people around me. I don't, I'm not buying into this. This is crazy. And I'm like, okay. I was the, I was the weird one. I didn't, I didn't have faith. I didn't see the effectiveness. I didn't understand it. And now I've, I've seen it. And when you see with your own eyes, it changed a lot of things. Many of you give you a few quotes that, that I've gone back to all the time over and over again. If any of this stuff, I was planning on doing a, an, an outline and giving you something to go home with if you want. If anybody finds it important, I can still put something together and you can hand out next week if you want. But some quotes of, of people that I like to read, people that have, that have gone before us, that have had intelligence and really affected my life as we're trying to you know, push into this prayer movement. Charles Spurgeon was quoted saying, I'd rather teach one man to pray than ten men to preach. That's coming from a 
preacher that he was worth his salt. Billy Graham, Reverend Billy Graham, to get nations back on their feet, we must first get down on our knees. Max Lucado, our prayers may be awkward, our attempts may be feeble, but since the power of prayer is in the one who hears it, not in the one who says it, our prayers do make a difference. You know how powerful that is, guys? It's okay, Noah. You know what? We don't know what to pray. I don't feel like I've got any power. That's good news. You're right. You don't have power. The Lord can use you. He can send His working power through you, and you can be a powerful being in Him, in Christ Jesus. But the great thing is, you don't have to rely upon your own strength. You're the one that's in prayer and supplication and intercession. He's the one that hears it. He's the one that has power. So as feeble as your attempts are, your prayers have power. That's an important lesson to learn. Oswald Chambers quoted saying, Prayer does not fit us for the greater work. Prayer is the greater work. It's important to dummy this down. I'm that guy. I'm a, I'm a doer. I'm just a doer. I've worked. I'm trying to work not to be such a doer. I just want to conquer mountains and things and had to slow down. It's important to realize that, man, I've spent a lot of my life skipping over prayer to go do something. Now I'm learning, you know what? I'm going to chill here for a little bit in prayer and figure out how much more effective I am. Use his strength, guys. Andrew Murray. Where there is much prayer, there will be much of the Spirit. Where there is much of the Spirit, there will be ever-increasing prayer. No doubt. If you've ever been in settings where Spirit is being sought out, moving, it's unbelievable. Is prayer, is prayer your steering wheel or is prayer your spare tire? Or a tin bar. That's true. The thing we go to when all else has failed, it's one more point I want to make. Preemptive prayer, maybe making up that statement, but preemptive prayer is important. I find this, I've seen this most often in mothers. Fathers, we tend to pray when all heck breaks loose, we're, we're praying about something. Mothers that are effective are praying for their kids before something ever happens. Fathers, you should be doing it as well, but I think there's much power in preemptive prayers. There's much power in praying over your kids, praying over your job, praying over your marriage, praying over your situation, praying over your business, praying over your job, praying over it before there's a problem. You pray into what it should look like. And part of the thing that's going to happen is the Lord's going to use you as being the effective person in that house, in that relationship. He's going to empower you through that prayer. But there's a lot of intelligence in us as parents preaching to our children, often where they can hear it. They don't have to hear it, but, but they should hear it. They should hear you praying over them, but you should also be in prayer on your own time, praying over what's going to be for their life. Not necessarily, what, you know, here's where you're going to go, but but Lord, you're going to guide him. You're going to protect him. You're going to keep him safe. You're going to do A, B, and C, and he's going to come to know you more than anything. I don't care what he does. He's going to come to know you. Because listen, I, I want these kids to go to school because I think there's major importance in it. But the John G. Lake, no, it's Smith Wigglesworth. Smith Wigglesworth. That, that's the dude. Smith Wigglesworth by trade's a plumber. So he, he's right at my eye. I'm, that's, I'm the same kind of guy. And I'm telling you what, there, there's a guy that, that moved mountains in his prayer, prayer life. Just a very effective person. And it doesn't mean we have to have this great education. It just means that you have to pray over your children that they will come to know the Lord. They will come to know Him. They don't, that they don't come to know mom and dad's faith because they can't ride on that very long. They come to know their own faith in Jesus. They come to meet Jesus. They know Jesus in a more important and deeper way than even we know. But they're the ones teaching us later. I'm telling you, if you can join in in these preemptive prayers instead of waiting for the problems to hit, change. Lastly, Leonard Ravenhill was quoted as saying, no man is greater than his prayer life. So I challenge you to that. A lot of things. We are taught growing up how to do all sorts of things. How to, how to treat somebody. How to have man how to clean our room, how to be respectful, how to go to school, how to hold a job, about a lot of things. Teach them to pray. 
I pray for you, teach yourselves, your family, children. That's all you have to affect. We can have ministries and try to reach more, but if each one of you just scripture get family, takes over the Pray us out. Lord Jesus, thank you for this time. Thank you for these people. Lord, I ask that your word did you justice today. Lord, I ask that it does cause us to think, even if it's just one thing, that it causes us to think. Every one of us. Better tomorrow than we were today. Amen today. Your word says to come in and don't come in and just Hold back our knowledge. Hold back what we've learned. We go out. Change. Help us to be strong. Help us to love you. Help us not to grow weary. Lord Jesus, we have we have lists. We have to do lists. Often, as wrote down, prayed. I ask change our that the no longer item on our to do list. You're an item on our do listen. You want to come before our feet hit the floor, before stress hits us, anything of the day that we simply say, Lord, love you. I want to commune with you. Be with me throughout this day. Remind me hour by hour my mind strays from you. Woo me as I want to woo you. Call me back. Let me live in ever dependent state of prayer of you right update uh, so our organization is called emerald house of prayer well oh, it is we have a building on the square so if you go into harrisonville if you just came off the square so you got the main square surrounding the courthouse if you go north you're heading towards ponds uh, heating the cooling stuff down there there's a standalone building there. It's a, it's a, we, we've got an entire city block. We have room to expand and this and that. That is going to be uh, the house of prayer. We're hoping, we are really, we had plans for April 22nd being our, our first open the door date, which as a builder by trade, that sounds absolutely insane. But wife's pretty adamant that something's happening on April 22nd, so something probably will happen. It might mean that we have a generator running outside and we have a prayer meeting. Don't know exactly what it's going to look like. Um, we're doing a full renovation on the building. It's it's uh, that's what the update's been is that we've we've had to really fight a battle. It's been interesting. We've we've literally fought a battle uh, with the city actually being able to do it. I mean, even just just really called out for what we're doing today. You had to be so many feet from the square to do something that oh, they're trying to classify us a lot of times as a church, and you're not allowed to be a church on the square, um, which isn't, it sounds really odd, but I look into a lot of jurisdictions, and it's it's kind of a norm. Um, churches tend to hinder some other business cells on the square, and so they like to you know, put you a little bit further away because you get the, the churches that stay there till midnight and count all the people at the bar next door, and it's, I just I guess it hasn't mixed well in the past, so that they have some rules. Um, but we've been in a fight, like, several times, but we've, we've won the battle every time. The Lord's come to our aid. I've tried to maintain composure and really exercise our rights through the Constitution of what we can and can't do. And it, it's going well. I mean, the, the difficult part's been... Uh, renovating the building we're being put in a classification that literally couldn't be high you know it's adding cost that's just astronomical to it but it's okay right? i mean it's like i said earlier the lord has provided for my family well and put us in a position that that oh you know, we gave up this to put into this and it's not personally giving up anything it's it's providing so it's it hasn't been a problem i mean at some point in time maybe we, We'll start running short, but I think we're literally at a spot where we've decided that we're probably going to build us a residence on the second floor of it because if we give away everything we got, we still need a place to live, and as long as it gives us a place to live upstairs, 
didn't really lose anything. So it's really been good. It's been a good lesson to me to learn that, and it's thought I acquired some stuff, thought it was important at one time. And it's really not of importance. And I, and I hate even saying it because I don't want to sound like I've done something. You know, my wife has done something. We haven't. We've, we've traded a house. We've traded another house going into a building and we're still going to have a house we, we, we haven't given up anything so please don't take it that I'm saying there's been a sack but it is a building that is literally a shell no electricity, there's no plumbing, there's no heating there, there's nothing I don't know why it's the Lord's plan I tried to talk him out of it why can't we go down the street and rent that place we'll be ready on Monday, no big deal but that, that wasn't his plan so you know, it's, uh, it's important to be obedient um, so our plan is is to link arms with houses like this. We'll have some sort of kickoff nights. I mean, what, I mean, this is really just to be an effective outreach. We will never be a church. We don't want to be a church. The importance is we couldn't be a church because that would that would conflict with churches that we're trying to work with. It just doesn't make sense. Besides, we've got a church that we attend and we love. So it's trying to be something that the rest of the days of the week that people come in. And we'll try to affect the youth as well. We'll try to have some stuff where we can try to get kids that, surprisingly, like a lot of the ministries that we work with in other states, I mean, Jesus is cool. He's, he can be really cool to younger generations. It's beautiful to see the teenagers and 20-somethings that are just on fire for the Lord, and it's just beautiful. So, you know, it's, we don't have an exact aim. We just know that it's going to be praise and worship. Don't know what the hours are going to be because we'll be building up worship leaders. Um, got a, several people that are going to be part of that, but we're not aspiring to be a 24 7 sort of thing. I mean, again, we'll do what the Lord says. Hope He never asks us to be 24 7. But so, yeah, the update is hopefully sometime in April, the 22nd, we'll have some sort of little kickoff type of deal. Um, probably even reach out to groups like this and say, hey, we're having a cleanup day. Doesn't that sound like fun? Y'all want to come? You know, we'll get pizza. <laughs> so there'll be times like that. But part of it's this. I believe the Lord has a vision for something like this that can be effective for people in the community and their children. And that when you buy in at the ground level, when you say, man, I was there when that first opened. I, I helped paint that wall over there, that it breeds community. And it, I just want it to be something where people consider this their home away from home that they can go to and be in the Lord's presence. I mean, that's just like Rod was saying, Holy Spirit, come. That, that is what a place like this is supposed to be, that it's just worship. You'll, you'll probably rarely hear any sort of message given. There, there can be intercessory prayer where during a, a set where, where they're singing, most of the time they're going to be singing the Bible. You can't go wrong when, you're, when you have gifted musicians that know how to worship prior to playing an instrument when their whole focus is to unto the Lord, to praise the Lord, singing his word back to him, you can't get off track. So that is a place that invites the Holy Spirit. So we want to foster a place where the Holy Spirit breaks out and is effective for this community, for the Cass County region, uh, be an extension 